Hey, this episode of the Adventist Millennial Podcast is sponsored by The Haystack. The Haystack is a voice for young adults in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that produces articles, music reviews, videos, and more. What's the and more? Well, you'll have to go to their website to find out. Thehaystack.org. The Haystack. Life. Culture. Theology. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are doing a Q&A episode, but before we get to all that, I just wanted to say, by this time, I'll be far, far away, out of town, and, uh, for once in my life, I actually recorded this beforehand, so hopefully you won't know, but I do want to give you guys a disclaimer that I will be gone a lot for the next few months, and hopefully that won't affect my production schedule, and it will be seamless, and you guys won't even tell that I'm so out of town all the time, but let's just be brutally honest here I'm a terrible multitasker and I don't know if that will happen I'll do my best only time will tell hopefully I won't drop the ball we'll see um <clears throat> in the meantime uh thanks to everyone who sent in questions if you didn't get a chance to send your question in um there's still time so send them to me at adventistmillennial at gmail.com or tweet me or send me a message on Facebook or Instagram or get on the Slack. Um, any, there's multiple and various ways in which you can reach me and I'll answer all of them eventually. Or if you have other things you just want to suggest topics for me to talk about or people for me to interview or just complain about the way my voice sounds, all of these things are fine. <laughs> Um, and now, before we jump into our topic, it's time for me to share what have I been consuming in pop culture that you might like, maybe not, a lot of people probably wouldn't like it, it's very edgy, but I just watched season two of Fleabag dropped on Amazon recently. Season one, it took me a minute to get into it, because it's very, like, shock value humor, um, and it's very <laughs> explicit in a lot of ways, so if you don't like that, then you definitely won't like this, but... The interesting thing about it is kind of the device that they use for television, which is weird. She's breaking the fourth wall and talking to the camera. Um, and the audience is like someone that she's trying to hide the truth of her life from. So it's like a an unreliable narrator, but it sort of unfolds through the season. <laughs> and I actually kind of liked season two a little bit better. Um, <laughs> but they still use, manage to use this breaking the fourth wall device, interestingly. And it's also just really funny. <laughs> Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who wrote it, um, is a really, really witty writer. <laughs> One of my favorite lines from season two is, she's run, she broke this thing, and she's running to uh, hide the fact that she broke it. Um, and then she comes running in, and <laughs> her sister goes... Why are you so sweaty? It's attention grabbing. <laughs> and I laughed really hard. Anyway, um if you like uh if you like interesting, funny, complex uh writing, then you'll like the show, but if you don't like a lot of swearing and a lot of sex, then you probably won't like it. Anyway, that's my recommendation for pop culture. Okay, here we go into the questions. So our first question is, what can we do to end the great controversy, especially in light of your assertion that we aren't supposed to make converts to the Adventist church? So a couple of weeks ago, you remember I talked about the fact that I don't think we should be converting people um, be because uh, we just want Adventists typically have just wanted to bash people over the head with how, how uh, correct we are and how much truth we have. Um, and I said that we shouldn't do that. We should just model Jesus to people. <laughs> so, so here, this is the question. How, how exactly are we supposed to end the great controversy if we're not actually converting people? Um, but if you take the philosophy that the great controversy is the way that it's ended is by actually, um, uh, validating God's claim about his own character, um, then truly, what does being an Adventist have to do with it? I mean, uh, Adventists love to think that we have this special knowledge and special truth, which maybe we do in some way, but does that have, does that take away from the fact that anyone can model Christ's character, SDA or not? I don't think it does. And I was speaking in a very specific Adventist 
vernacular um, when I was talking about not converting people. People. What I mean when I say we shouldn't convert people is only true if you're defining conversion the way that Adventists generally do, um, as part of the lexicon of Adventism, which is to make someone Adventist. Uh, so the real objective of converting people, in my mind, should be demonstrating God's character to them, to anyone who's watching, um, and and convincing them that it's such a more fulfilling way to live that they want that for themselves, which is completely independent of whether or not they believe the SDA fundamental beliefs. Um, <laughs> like, whether or not you believe in this creed that isn't really a creed has nothing to do with whether you can, uh, be, a, be a mature, uh, Christian person who acts in selfless love towards other people all the time. Uh, even though in theory, the 28 fundamental beliefs are supposedly supposed to help us reach that or to coincide with Christ's character, uh, the results practically are not always that. So uh, my suspicion is that our understanding of theology is way wronger or more incorrect than we think it is because we just don't have good information in perspective. So therefore, when we're trying to convert people by making them believe what we believe instead of making them like Christ, it's counterproductive. So like Adventists trying to say, this is exactly what's happening in the universe, the prophetic books, history, other dimensions, and this is exactly how God is acting out his relationship with humanity. Um, like, for example, in the investigative judgment in the sanctuary <laughs> is a little bit um, naive to think that we understand all of that completely. It's like my grandmother trying to understand the internet. Like, she just doesn't. She may have some small conception, but she just doesn't have a good grasp on what it really is or how it really works. When she says to me, oh, can you look up the recipe for shoe pow on the internet? And I do. And <laughs> and then she says, okay, print print that recipe. And I say, which one? And she says, just print all of them. And I say, grandma, all the shoe pow recipes on the internet? I don't think you understand how the internet works. <laughs> um, like she has the basic idea that you can get recipes on the internet, but that's not even close to understanding how the internet works and what it is. And I think that's kind of the reality of our understanding of theology. We might have a pretty baseline understanding that allows us to conclude things and live our lives um, uh, accordingly, but that doesn't mean we understand <laughs> everything. So I feel like I, my suspicion is that we're going to find out a lot of what we think about religion and theology is like, um, it's just cute based on what we actually know, but it's totally misconstruing what's actually true. <laughs> like, that's, that's a very simplistic childlike way of understanding it, but sure, that will get you there, but it's not anywhere close. <laughs> to reality. So in my mind, the real converting people that we need to be doing to end the great controversy is leading people who are under in our sphere of influence to be in a place where they want to refine their character and be more like Christ and more in line with the principles that Christ espoused. And that doesn't mean they have to be Seventh-day Adventist. And to be converted is not to believe what we believe about the 144,000 or the second death or whatever, um, because more than likely we don't have a full picture of all of that <laughs> either. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, that's why, uh, that's my answer. Okay, next question. What's your favorite C.S. Lewis book? Um, I would say my favorite C.S. Lewis book is Paralandra. This is the second book in the space trilogy that he wrote, um, which obviously you kind of need to read the first one, which is Out of the Silent Planet, to get fully get Paralandra. Um, but that being said, uh, of the three, Paralandra is my favorite because it really deals with the concept of maturing to a place where you understand free will um, and how that affects our ability to live and to interact with other free 
beings. Um, and C.S. Lewis is such a deep intellectual and he wrestles with such big philosophical ideas that it almost twists your mind into knots just trying to untangle the implications of everything that he's saying through this book. It's really interesting. I won't give you the plot because it's, like I said, it's complicated and deep and intellectual, but it's so much to think about and it's an incredibly engaging book. I really, really enjoyed it. In fact, I want to go back and re- I read, I read the whole space trilogy when I was like 12 or 13 and I obviously didn't fully understand what he was uh, dealing with or wrestling with philosophically. It was just like a weird, creepy space story. Um, and then I recently went back. I read the first two like six months ago um, and really, really enjoyed how deep they were. I didn't reread the third one because I remember being creeped out by it as a kid and also according to the internet, Abolition of Man, which is just basically a philosophical summary of the ideas he tackles in that book, is a lot shorter and a little bit easier to to digest than the story form of it, because the last book is really, really long. Anyway, um, I may go ahead and reread that one too, but yeah, Paralandra, I would say, uh, of his fiction books. His nonfiction books, I haven't read all of them, but I'm sure those are all excellent as well. Next question. How did the Chronicles of Narnia impact your faith? Um, this is a good question. I don't know that it has directly impacted my faith as just sort of been reinforcing it behind the scenes because like I said with the Space Trilogy, I consumed these stories as a kid and I wasn't really thinking deeply about uh, what they meant or what the allegories that he was drawing. And I don't think, of course, that it was quite as intense or deep as the ideas he was dealing with in the Space Trilogy, but certainly the simple allegories that parallel Christianity, you know, as a kid you can pick up on some of that stuff. Uh, so to the extent that I could, and now looking retrospectively at those stories, um, I can see Lewis's philosophy intertwined in them, but for the most part, they were just stories <laughs> for me when I was a kid. We listened to the Focus on the Family audio uh, dramatizations of them and watched the, the movies of them, and it was just fun. So, I, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know that it necessarily impacted my faith, but you get the idea. Okay, um, next question. How do you read Ellen White stuff when it's so old and so dense? Do I need to read it? <laughs> have a sneaking suspicion that someone's being a little facetious. So I, all I have to say to this is, as an English major and a lit snob, I like this sort of thing. <laughs> Old timey, like, we, uh, lit snobs like Shakespeare and James Joyce and all this highfalutin word crafted old timey language where you have to just really contort yourself to even figure out what they're saying. <laughs> There's a prestige in that. It's like, uh, Rick Warren is regular Winnie the Pooh, and E.G. White is top hat and monocle Winnie the Pooh. You know, that Winnie the Pooh meme. <laughs> fancy Pooh. Ellen White is fancy Pooh, <laughs> and everyone else is just regular Pooh. Um, but I mean, if you want to actually take something useful away from Ellen White, rather than just reading it to feel bougie and erudite and all of this kind of thing... <laughs> Um, I think all you have to do is just read every third word, and that will be sufficient to pare it down to be more understandable. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, you little question troll. Uh, okay. What's your favorite podcast, and why is it Burn the Haystack? Hmm. I also wonder who wrote this question. Hmm. Oh, that's weird. Did the Ben Shapiro show change its name to Burn the Haystack? <laughs> just kidding everyone i can't listen to ben anymore after he got owned by that old british guy <laughs> okay moving on what's your dream interview hmm let's see so many names i could think of maybe zach levi on his christianity angus t jones on his brief brush with adventism caleb isley on all the things he hasn't admitted to the adventist community about his favorite television shows maybe who knows i could interview anyone and they could be my dream interview if they really said something spicy and entertaining uh next question why is brie larson so unlikable well i think it depends on who you ask 
But really, because once the internet decides something about you, it is reality. Like, I have no opinion about her because I don't really watch Marvel movies and I don't care about her as an actress per se. But, like, I saw her back in the day in Room and other movies like that and, and I didn't have a problem with her at that point. But she's gotten pegged as unlikable <laughs> now since Captain Marvel. Um... And she certainly doesn't seem to be doing herself any favors to garner <laughs> any likability. Um, but it is really hard to tell who someone actually is through all the subterfuge of character and publicity and things like marketing. So I don't know. And to be honest, I don't really care um, if she's likable or not <laughs> in real life. It's just fun to rip her because that's the bandwagon of the minute, like the meme. Uh, you know, nobody likes Brie Larson. It's just the thing to do. <laughs> Uh, next question. Did you watch Endgame? What's your favorite character in the Marvel Universe? Well, if you just heard what I said, I don't care about Marvel and I don't watch the movies. I've only seen a handful, so I don't really know. I don't- I didn't even see Deadpool or Infinity War or anything. I saw the old- at this point they're old- the Iron Man, um, <laughs> when they first came out, the Iron Man movies. I think I saw Thor Ragnarok and like two of the Captain America movies, but that's about it. Um, the only thing that I retained from any of these experiences is that is the big red guy in the second Captain America movie that he was like a Nazi villain or something and he gets his close up and all he says is you are failing and we all just fell out laughing in the theater and ruined the experience for everyone else. <laughs> I mean, like, what can I say? I just, I'm not super into superheroes, so sorry. Um, what do you think about adapting the popular mobile game for religion? SDA Go! <laughs> I mean, yes, we should do it. Let's all go out there and catch Adventist pioneers, or actually, would it be like catching Adventist celebrities? <laughs> like, throw your Ellen ball at Ted Wilson and catch him. I'm into it. I would play that game. I think it's probably a winner because Pokemon Go is not over, is it? <laughs> Uh, next question. How is, how has your journey been shaped between Bible Belt, Texas and liberal California? Oh, this is a good question. Um, because politically speaking, yes, Texas is much, very much a red state and California is very much a blue state, but the reality is it's not been extremely different for me day to day. Uh, I mean, yes, the general sentiment in culture is more politically liberal here in California, um, <clears throat> but because I hang out in religious circles, <laughs> even if the heretics in these religiously liberal conferences are more politically liberal than, say, people in the Southern Union, <laughs> um, they're still much more politically conservative than the general population. I mean, the Southeastern California Conference, and I'm sorry to this person who maybe is not an Adventist that I'm talking about, <laughs> the structure of the Adventist church, but the Adventist church within Southern California um, is considered extremely liberal by other Adventists. However, politically speaking, most Christians are still fairly conservative. You do have kind of the social justice, extreme liberal section of the evangelical world. I don't think that's huge necessarily in Adventism. So my group of peers and the people that I hang around with tend to be, even if they are a little bit liberal, they're not as liberal as just your average person in Southern California who doesn't, isn't religious, if that makes sense. Um, and let's be honest, most Americans are still really very friendly and nice, especially if politics doesn't just come up in every conversation you have. Like, if you're not just always harping on politics, most people are just friendly, um, and you can get along if you don't talk about it. Now, when you contrast Americans with people in other countries, I think there is a big difference, and I've spent a little bit of time in other countries and will be spending some more time in other countries, and I think that the more time you do that, it becomes more apparent, um... <laughs> That chasm is growing within the political sphere in the United States. But like I said, my personal experience, because of the circles I run in, uh, it's not a huge difference between Texas and California. Uh, culturally speaking, obviously, there are some things that are grating 
like uh, how difficult it is to get your concealed carry license, etc., etc., etc. But this is all political stuff. I don't think it necessarily has to do with being in the Bible Belt versus being somewhere else like uh, here. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, next, thoughts on anti-Trinitarians and their theology. Um, I'm not a theologian, so I can't argue the details of this doctrine. I don't have, like, a really, really deep understanding of it. But from my very cursory, um, grasp, in general, uh, I think my view is that the Trinity is the only conception of God who can truly, uh, fulfill the idea of selfless love. Um, I've talked about this before in another episode, uh, I can't remember which episode it was, but I talked about the need for three entities to have truly selfless love, um, so a god that is encompassed by three beings is the only way that that, that idea will work. Um, to really be selfless, you can't be a, a an individual because you have no one to love. Um, it's harder to be two because you can still be in a t in a pair relationship and be completely selfish uh, because each person can just feed the other's ego. Um, that's why <laughs> when kids are born and you have at least three, uh, you're forced to become selfless because uh, you have to give to the other two people in the relationship. So that's why the Godhead to me makes sense because of how I understand who God is. And if you remove that, then, you know, it just all you're left with is this general authoritarian conception of God. Um, and I... I reject that. So that's why I personally don't believe in anti-Trinitarian anti arguments. If you wanted me to go through and rebut, you know, like point by point from Bible verses or whatever, whatever, I probably couldn't do that. But, but other people who are a little bit more knowledgeable than I am have talked about the idea of needing three entities in the Godhead for selfless love. Tim Jennings has talked about it. You should... Uh, he's a great person to listen to on this. David Ashrick, I've heard talk about this. And, and as a side note, I don't think that if Jesus were subordinate to God, as I think this doctrine goes, is that, um, Jesus is not quite on par with God and he is like subject to God. Anyway, um, if Jesus was subordinate to God, does that actually make a big difference in our practical existence as humans? I mean, it changes the conclusions that we draw about God, but it doesn't actually change us or what we're able to do or how we should live our lives. Um, it's just something for people to argue about in doctrine. And, and I think to the extent that it changes our understanding of who God is, it's a problem. But beyond that, you know, everybody's, people are going to find something to argue about no matter what. So just don't argue about it. I, I'm not super invested in, in trying to understand this because at a baseline level, it philosophically disagrees what I believe. Um, so I don't need to necessarily, you know, suss out all the details of it. But if somebody wants to come on and talk about it or, and advocate for it or, or break it down or whatever, um, I'd be open to that. What advice would you give to Gen Z about how to thrive in their local church? Um, good question. Uh, I don't have a lot of Gen Z people necessarily in my life. Um, so uh, I don't know their struggle at, on a really deep level. I know that it's, that like millennials, but to an even greater extent, technology plays a huge role in their life. And I actually went to a really interesting mental health conference about uh, anxiety, depression, and suicide. And one of the presenters was talking about sort of Gen Z's experience with technology and the causes and increases of anxiety and depression that it's causing and all of this sort of thing and the struggles that, that they're having. 
Yeah, I don't know exactly that that connects directly to this question, but I would my suggestion just for anyone, but including Gen Z, is to, is to find the comedy in your situation at all times because we all know, all of us older generations, Gen Z, we know that there are frustrating things in the church, in the people in the church. There are things that make you want to scream and tear your hair out and say, well, how are you a Christian when you're acting like this <laughs> and treating people this way? When you see that stuff, learn to find the comedy in it learn to find, be amused by it don't let yourself get bent out of shape and get uh resentful um <laughs> toward other people uh because of the things that they do the way that legacy adventism drives younger people up a wall just let yourself enjoy the irony of it hopefully as we're doing <laughs> with this adventist millennial stuff um, as well as try to find the real meaningful relationships that can be built in a close religious community. Um, but when you inevitably run into those things that are just so sour to you, um, don't let other people ruin your experience. Let them be what enriches it where, where they can, even if you're laughing a little bit behind your hand, which is what I'm usually doing. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, just to summarize, don't let what other people do that doesn't make sense to you or turns you off ruin your Christian experience. Learn to laugh. Learn to um, see other people for the struggles that they're having and realizing that we all <laughs> are horrible and flawed and most of us don't get it. Um, and just try to have your experience despite the fact that we all, humanity, everyone sucks. We all do. <laughs> okay, what's your favorite episode from another SDA podcast and why? <laughs> Let me think. Since I don't actually listen to other SDA podcasts, this is a hard question. No, I'm just kidding. I do listen. I listen to all of you guys. <laughs> Um, probably one that, I don't know if I have a favorite necessarily, but one that I listened to recently that I really enjoyed and kind of sticks out in my mind. Um, if you haven't listened to it, you should go check it out. Uh, as I've mentioned multiple times, Dr. Jennings, Dr. Tim Jennings, who runs Come and Reason Ministries, I always enjoy what he has to say. And he went on the Ideas Digest podcast that my buddy Conrad has. So go look up that podcast and find the episode with Dr. Jennings. He expounds a little bit more on uh, homosexuality in Christianity and his view on it and um, sort of the unconventional take that most Adventists don't want to hear. Um, but he talk, I've heard him talk a little bit about it before in other settings, but he kind of gives a little bit more explanation here. And I think it's really interesting. And so you should go check it out. Um, um, and that's all the questions we have. Okay. Thanks everyone for sending in your questions. Thanks for listening. If you have more, you want to say, always find me on the internet. Um, but not in real life, because I might run away and scream. <laughs> and until then, until, yeah, until then, I will talk to you in the next one. This episode was made possible and sponsored by Kicking Your Siblings. If you have ever gone through a harrowing experience, it's likely the fault of your siblings. So just go ahead and kick them. This is a public service announcement and also... <laughs> And also a way to relieve stress and to bring down the people that are your arch nemeses. Use offer code HEHITMEFIRST to get five minutes off your next timeout.